Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Reverend Sharizna Jean-Marie, and the Director for Racial Justice Ministries at Scarrett Bennett Center, and I'm excited for another opportunity to have you with us so that we might continue these conversations about what it means to eradicate racism among us. Um, and so I'm grateful for our um, conversation today and our special guest today coming all the way from Ghana. Um, and so you know, we'll have an opportunity to introduce her later, but let me introduce my co-laborer here, Anna Massey, who is the marketing manager at Scarrett Bennett Center. Um, thank you so much, Anna, for being here. Anna will actually facilitate the question, the question and uh, comment section here. So we wanna invite you and remind you that you're always welcome to join the, in the conversation by including your comments and also your questions, the comment section of our Facebook Live. And as always, this is sacred space. And while we welcome all to participate and um, difference is also welcome, difference of opinion and different perspectives is always welcome, but difference does not mean disrespect or hate. So any comments that reflect disres that's re disrespectful or hateful, we will delete immediately. So thank you, Anna, for joining us. And we look forward to um, you facilitating the question and answer period later on this afternoon. It is such a great honor to have um, Esther Aman. Did I say that right? Aman. Aman um, with us. I met Esther many years ago, maybe 2011, 2012 at the Proctor Conference where she was hosting a workshop on emotional justice. And just grateful that we were able to connect again and collaborate for this work. Um, I'm excited about um, the ways in which both our institutions will come together to continue this conversation. But I wanna start by inviting Esther to introduce herself. Tell us a little bit about you. You know, storytelling is part of the work that we do here at Scarrett Bennett Center. So would you mind introducing yourself? Tell us a little bit about you and where you grew up and your family and, um, and how, what brought you to this work um, here in 20. 20. Thank you. Thank you so much. So good evening to everybody. It's evening here in Ghana, afternoon, um, where you are. Um, from wherever in the world you're joining us, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to Sharizna for inviting me to participate in this. Um, so my name is Esther Arma. I'm coming to you live from Accra, which is Ghana's capital city. Um, I am the executive director of the Arma Institute of Emotional Justice. And we provide emotionality education in the context of race, gender, and culture using the emotional justice framework. We'll talk a bit about that um, later. Um, Esther, first name, middle name Aketsi, which is um, Ghanaian. I was born on Sunday, last name Amar. That's my daddy's name, God rest his soul. And I was born in London, um, in the UK. And then pretty much, I always say I kind of came, I was halfway out the womb in London. By the time I kind of landed in the hospital, I was already in, in Ghana. So I was in London and Ghana as a very young child, ended up going to school in, in London and then started traveling, um, very young, traveled across Europe and then um, uh, in Ghana again, became a journalist. And as a journalist, I was very lucky and grateful to have traveled across the continent, working in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in South Africa. Um, then I moved to New York, lived in New York for eight years. I claim Brooklyn Bed-Stuy, claim that as home. Um, I feel like the world of global black folk gathers in Bed-Stuy and I had these beautiful Francophone African neighbors, Haitian neighbors, Jamaican food, this just beautiful um, global black village that was in um, um, Bed-Stuy. And I was a radio host for WBAI, which is one of the radio stations of Pacifica. And um, Really, you know, my dad um, was an activist, I would say, who became a politician. And he actually worked in the government of Kwame Nkrumah. And so we are a family that lived through the military coups of Ghana. And really the birth of emotional justice is the result of my family's experience. Essentially, military coups in Ghana kind of treated as a date in history. So you'll know that February in, in history, February 24th, 1966 is the first coup because it deposes Kwame Nkrumah, the father of Pan-Africanism. 
he is deposed and the heady days of post-independent Ghana, um, where we had people like Martin Luther King come to our pre presidential inauguration. Um, extraordinary level of global Black activism, African-American, Jamaican, were in Ghana as Ghana became the first nation to be independent. And my dad was there. Kwame Nkrumah was his boss. And so I had the blessed experience of being around these amazing global Pan-African men as a young girl. Um, the dual experience was living through the trauma of military coups. That is where I learned that the history that is taught in books is actually the lived experience of black people. That that which is read about as a sentence or a page in a book actually is our lived experience. And for me, the birth of emotional justice was a very personal space. It started within my family. And it was really very simple. I had no memory of the coups that I lived with, um, but my body held the memory of the trauma of that night. And I would wake up and have terrible nightmares, night terrors. I could hear boots stomping in my head. Thought I was going crazy. And I was this young girl getting an education. I was smart and I was getting educated. I was getting smarter, but my heart, my soul felt damaged. I felt broken. Um, I felt crazy because I had no memory of the coup. I couldn't understand where these night terrors, these nightmares were coming from. That was the first time I understood that you can be as educated as you want, as smart as you want, but when your heart and your soul is damaged and broken, that will shape how you move through the world, how you love in the world, how you lead in the world, and how you work in the world. And so it was a personal truth that made me start to connect the idea of emotions and emotionality having a particular power. From the personal, it then went into my work. I was a journalist. I was working with the BBC in um, London. I was traveling to places like Kenya to South Africa. And it was when I went to two, two trips, actually. One was Philadelphia, actually for the Million Woman March in uh, 1997. An amazing, amazing time, Eakins Oval in Philly, seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of black women from literally all over the world gathering um, to stand up for who they are, for what they love, for their families, for a, a fuller freedom and a healed freedom. It was really powerful. But the keynote at the Million Women March was Winnie Mandela, and I was blessed to meet her. And I told her that I was getting ready to go to South Africa and do a story on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And Willie Mandela said to me, and I never forget these words, she said, I know you have interviews lined up with the senior leaders of the ANC. I was interviewing Oliver Tambo, huge figure of the African National Congress, the ANC, Nelson Mandela's party. I was gonna be interviewing Desmond Tutu, the architect of the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission. I was traveling to Cape Town. And Willie Mandela said to me, I want you to go into the townships. I want you to sit with the women of the townships and I want you to listen to their stories. She said, I want you to listen to a forgiveness that will sound like rage, but that will be healing for them. I need you to understand more fully what this is. And right now your understanding is limited. So I remembered what she said and I traveled to South Africa and I, di I did exactly what she told me to do. And that transformed me as a journalist and really was the next stage of me understanding that for black people, the emotional is also political and that we must connect our experience of the politics of inequity, of the brutality of our history to emotions, to our hearts, to our souls. Because with the ANC, I've seen it with my dad's generation, there was a fight for independence, there was a fight for political citizenship, for recognition at the ballot. That fight was won and apartheid, there was a fight for the ballot. But I remember sitting with Steve Biko, major freedom fighter, God rest his soul, but with his widow and her eldest son. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget this. And I sat and this woman said to me, why would I worry about the forgiveness of white people? I have to deal with my people I have to look at black men 
who had to go through so much just to stand and stay as men and stay alive and lost parts of themselves every time they tasted humiliation in order to come home. I had to watch black women stand in front of soldiers and guns and people who absolutely did not see them as human and then get up and stand again. I have to learn and deal with and think about and forgive what we have had to do to survive. So why is it I am watching a process that says, let us, as in global black South African people, forgive them the white minority who were the architects of apartheid. And so emotional justice was about connecting the emotional to the political lived experience of black people seeking freedom and understanding that the fullest freedom never comes just from the ballot, never comes just from economics. There has to be a shift in your heart and in your soul because that brutality shape shifted who you were in your spirit, who you were in your heart. It had to in order for us to survive. So we survived. The question with emotional justice, how then do we heal with that context in mind? So that's really the beginning of it. And then living in New York and working with phenomenal activists, scholars, academics, having a radio show, I saw a commitment to social justice. I watched, I was in the midst of working around civil rights. But what I understood from that work was that a nurtured intellect and a nurtured education with a neglected emotionality cannot get you to your fullest freedom. Trauma shape shifts how you see yourself and how you see one another. Untreated trauma is part of the lived experience of our history. And understanding then that your heart and your spirit must be a justice project because it has taken a fight and a movement to get a recognition of your civil rights, to get any kind of social justice, to think about racial justice. So your heart and your soul is part of a justice project. So that part that is the feeling part, the emotions, the emotional, that too must be connected to justice. And that really is why emotional justice is for global black people. Birthed in a, in a black little girl in London and in Ghana, expanded to South Africa, really developed in New York, and it is for us, for our fullest healing. I, I, I'm literally finding myself getting emotional because, um, you know, we Black people never really get the benefit of the doubt, and we don't have the privilege to show emotions in public without it being considered um, dangerous to white people. And so when you say, you know, for black people, emotion, emotions is political, that's often not a privilege we have um, to be emotional in public or even to be emotional about the plight, the effects of racism in our lived experiences, particularly not in public because we're constantly playing the role of having to take care or nurture white people, have, having to teach them or having to literally sit still because there's a gun in our face when we're stopped by police. We are literally targets. And so we don't have the privilege to react, to show emotion. So in many ways, our humanity, right, is stolen from us in our lived experiences because our emotions are considered dangerous. So I'd like for you to go a little deeper in terms of why this is so important work in terms of emotional justice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that is honestly so um, powerful. Um, and it's so crucial that you put it in that context because emotional justice is a framework. It's a framework that I created and it has a very specific intention. It deals with, explores and engages a legacy of untreated trauma that shapes how we lead, learn, love, work and build. Mm -hmm. And the way that it works is that we create language we develop work to explore what emotional justice is. So let me give you an example. You talked about the emotions of black people being dangerous. The reason we talk about untreated trauma is that the history of brutality forced black people to, to do what I call 
have emotional undergrounds. You had to take the, the feelings of rage and anger. You had to really swallow them hard in order to stay alive. There was no choice. So Audrey Law teaches us that um, your silence will not protect you. That's right. But historically, it was a, the thing that did protect you. Silence was not about protecting black people. It was about privileging white supremacy to feel supreme. That's how it worked. And so what emotional justice is about is about putting emotions in the context of the history that we've lived and then saying, okay, anger, as an example, anger, which is a human emotion, everybody feels angry because of a situation, because of a scenario, but you put anger in the body of a black woman and it becomes something different. So mm. a woman who is black and happens to be angry, every black woman knows that that phrase, angry black woman is a trigger. That's right. It is a trigger that then immediately puts you on the defensive. You know you're being judged. You know that somebody's looking at you with some element of suspicion or disqualification or somehow whatever is coming out of your mouth can no longer be trusted because now you're quote unquote an angry black woman. That's right. So that in emotional justice, we say that angry black woman is not the description of a woman who happens to be black and feels angry. We talk about it as a nation state. It signifies something to both black people and white people. That's right. And that if when we recognize that that sits within the context of an entire lived history, it, then it has to change how we think about that reality. What do I mean by that? That in this moment, in this moment of pandemic, police brutality and protest, we have to dismantle what we call emotional patriarchy. Because that idea of an angry black woman, the idea of what we call a racialized emotionality and a racialized emotionality is when you take an emotion like anger, and then you add color, you put it in context, and then it has a consequence. Right. So the emotion is anger, everybody feels angry. You add color, you make it black. Um, you add gender, you make it a black woman. You put it in the context of the history of what an angry black woman represents. What is the consequence? You're being treated differently. Your anger is never just an emotion that will just, that's temporary and that will move on like everybody else's is. You know what that means. So it's what we call a racialized emotionality. Why does that exist? It exists because of what we call in emotional justice, emotional patriarchy. Emotional patriarchy is a system in society that bows down to the feelings of white men. Ooh. That is what we are living in right now. What does that mean in practice? It means that when white men feel powerless, black people are in trouble. Because how do you assert your power <laughs> if your only understanding of power is in relationship to someone else? That's the, the, the cancer of white supremacy is you have to be supreme over somebody or something. And because of the way we've constructed race, then the way you're supreme is over black people. And so power in and of itself is not dangerous. It's that the understanding of power within our world, black and white, is that for white men to be feel powerful, it's in relationship to the subjugation and the exploitation of black people. You only feel powerful if I am less powerful than you are. You have to see it, you have to feel it, you have to experience it, and then you feel powerful. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is there is no amount of subjugation and exploitation that will be enough. And you will never, ever not feel powerful unless Black people are powerless. If that is the equation for which you have power, we will always be in trouble. So what does emotional justice ask us to do? You have to dismantle emotional patriarchy. That is where white people come in. It is the work of white people, those who call themselves progressive, liberal, who claim any kind of commitment to justice. In emotional justice, we say the work of those who describe themselves as um, allies to movements, to justice, their work is the dismantling of emotional patriarchy. Right. And why does that matter? Because as long as white men, as long as the world bends to the feelings of white men, black people will die. Because if you look at the history of police brutality, that phrase, I was in fear of my life, is evidence of emotional pa patriarchy in practice. Why? The white police officer has the power of the state. 
the power of the badge, the power of the gun, the power of the taser can look at a 12 year old child playing in a park and say, you're scared. That is what we call an emotional justice, manufactured fear. It's manufactured because it's not real, but it's in the context of a history that turns, that took, removed the humanity from a people and made them monsters in order for you to feel powerful in terms of your brutality. You that construct of a system made that happen. So we know that when it comes to racism, we know that when it comes to white supremacy, the point about emotional justice is, it's how you then weaponize emotions to justify brutality. So anger is dangerous for black women and black men, for black, all black people. Tears are almost like a luxury. The idea that you would um, break is almost like a luxury that black people don't feel that they have. The idea that you can um, be strong as a quality, not as a characteristic, because everybody can feel strong sometimes and not feel so strong other times. But we have this other phrase, to be a strong black woman or to be a strong, that idea of strength is so much more than a feeling. It's an entire description of an entire group of women. And part of what we say is it actually can make you feel shackled and it can lose you the, um, the protection and the support of a community who believe that there's nothing that you, can, you can't handle. And it means that where sometimes we should be more tender, more forgiving, more loving and more supporting to black women, we're not because the strong black woman can handle anything. And that's never been true. It's never been true. I the see other just really, because one of the worst things you can do is describe me as a, a strong black woman. And I get that a lot. You're so strong, you're so strong. And, and, and for me, it, it really is a, a resistance to a kind of idea um, that black women are strong, that like you, like you said, we can handle anything. And so what we see often is, we see these black women who just lost a loved one, whether it's the mother, the sister, the auntie, and we now put them in front of cameras and use them, right, and their emotions as prop to kind of share a trauma that oftentimes I think America romanticized. We romanticize black trauma, black women's trauma. We put these women who are grieving in front of cameras and claim and celebrate how strong they are, right? And so, yeah, talk more about that because for me, for me, that's violence. That's emotional Absolutely. violence. And in emotional justice, we go a step further. We say that, you know, black trauma historically has been entertainment. It has been spectacle. Um, it has enabled and empowered white people, white men in particular. Um, and entire um, mythical ideas have been created to justify why black trauma um, is something that can feed whiteness in the sickest, most depraved way. Right. But the other point is that, because um, it matters that we talk about, and this is something that we say with um, in emotional justice, that grieving for black people is not a series of natural emotions that everybody else has. So you look at the world of grieving and people talk about you have anger, you have denial, you have despair, you have depression, you have all these feelings. But, but for so many black people, particularly when their, their loved ones are lost to publicly witnessed racial violence, or even, not, even if not witnessed, but they're lost to state sanctioned violence, they immediately have to go into what I call the work of humanization. That's right. The work of getting other people to empathize with their loss, with their loss by humanizing their loved ones. That is a peculiar, particular work for black people. White people do not have to do this and have never had to do this. And so the added burden of what it means to grieve your loved one is particular and peculiar to black people. And so because of that burden, it actually, again, shapeshifts who black people become. But when I talk about grieving, because the losses that you're grieving are not just the loss of your loved one. Just as this moment that is so transformative for many is traumatizing for black people, it is not simply the loss of George Floyd. There are all the people that you have lost 
um, whose names that nobody knows um, and whose lives have never been mourned, but who you've had to fight for to have any sense of, well, this was somebody that was loved by someone, that was missed, that was part of a family, part of a community, somebody's lover or brother or sister or, or, or friend. And those elements of the fullness of a human being are lost because of um, black people become symbolic to movements. That's and right. so who they are as lived human beings get lost. And also this other point that's really important is that so much of what is expected when black people grieve in front of the camera, they have got to do what I call, make sure they have the empathy vote. And the empathy vote for mainstream America mainstream the world, it's true in the UK as well, main, what I call mainstream white people, the empathy vote requires you be what I call measured, mm. be stoic, have a level of grace. And I'm thinking about a mother who, who lost her child. I mean, George Floyd's mother, God rest her soul, has been dead for two years. I think of Ahmaud Aubrey and his mother watching her child be killed. And how a mother would, you, it would be the most natural thing for her to lose her mind every time she was spoken to about it. That's but right. you know, but, but black people know that in order to hold the attention of the public at large, there has to be a grace and a stoicness. There's a way that you have to present your trauma to be digested by the white mainstream. Otherwise, there's what we call in emotional justice, the empathy exodus. People will leave if you lose your mind and grieve in the way that a human being would grieve. That's so right. what does that mean for us? It means that in emotional justice, we create process and practice in order to do what we call emotional well-being in the context of our history. Mm -hmm. But what do I mean by that? I mean that when black people saw the video of George Floyd and they were, what the protest to me was a wailing. It was a historical wailing of generations of trauma right. flooding out all over the world, all over the world, capitals all over the world came out onto the streets. Right. And for many white people, maybe new to this work of racial injustice, they're looking and talking about a video. For black people, you're talking about 500 years an absolute global inheritance of white supremacist terror That's exploded. Right. And if it is not measured in that context, people will think you need a quick gain for there to be a quick healing. That's right. But this is, and emotional justice is about organizational reform. And organizational reform has never been a quick thing. It's the work of connecting individual behavior to institutional change in order that equity becomes real, equality becomes real. But part of the importance of that um, idea of trauma, we've seen black trauma inform corporations' behavior. So they've made statements of solidarity. White supremacy measures change according to however little they do there should be a gratitude on behalf of global black people. Hmm. And what emotional justice requires is not a reconciliation, but an accountability. That's right. And accountability means that the culture of your organization, of your institution must change. Without that kind of cultural change, your policy, your commitment to diversity means nothing. Not you're, in you're really pushing some buttons right here because um, you know these last few weeks, um, we've heard a whole lot of black people say to white people, white friends, stop calling me to say, I feel bad and I'm praying for you. Because part of that is again, white people who feel guilty and they're trying to express their, their guilt by reaching out to black friends and coworkers to say, I just wanna let you know, I really feel bad about this. And part of the, I feel guilty is this idea of reconciliation, right? And oftentimes when we take, talk about anti-racism work, what white people really mean is how do we reconcile? But the problem rec with reconciliation is there's no accountability, right? I've never heard a white person say, how do we take account for what's happened to Black people over 400 years, how do we take responsibility, 
right? And so, yeah, I'd like to talk a, a, a little bit about the notion or the prop, the, the problem with wh white allyship. And, right. and, and I mentioned this to you earlier before, you know, part of this anti-racism work, we often hear this concept and language around white allyship. And my problem with white allyship is, is this idea that white people approach anti-racism work as if racism is a black person's problem that they're coming to help. Right. And uh, your privilege is intact, right? And so if I have a problem and you as a white per person, because you're my friend and you wanna come help me, you still have privilege in that you get to decide if you come help, when you come help, how long you help, what you sacrifice, what you give up, when in fact racism is a human problem where I really truly believe is really a problem that white people need to eradicate, need to yeah. primarily take responsible for to dismantle. Yet yeah. black people are constantly given the burden to um, eradicate, all while having the lived experience, right? The effects of it. And, and then we have to take care of white people. We have to educate white people. And then when they come help, they want us to celebrate because you're a white ally. So I think white allyship is the wrong concept, the wrong narrative, even the wrong idea. Co-conspirator is the language I think is more appropriate, the concept that's more appropriate because co-conspirator suggests that you recognize that racism is a human issue that I need to participate in eradicating. So talk a little bit more about, you know, this concept of white people and the ways in which they ought to be taking full responsibility in er eradicating eradicating racism, absence of the burdening a white, I mean, black people. Uh, such crucial points you make there, um, Sharizna. You know, so with, with emotional justice as a framework, as an idea, we develop language. And we say that emotional justice is first and foremost for global black people, and it is a healing. But we say emotional justice is also for white people. For them, it is a reckoning and it is a dismantling. When it comes to the language um, and the, uh, the behavior of white people in emotional justice, we say that white people have got to stop requiring black people to be what we call in emotional justice, their emotional mammies. And the reason we use the term emotional mammies is that in the context of our history, of course, uh, whether it's colonialism, apartheid or enslavement, Black people took care of white people's children and them, and them their, their, their needs, their bodies, they were taken care of. And emotional mammies is the expectation by white people that black people take care of white people's emotions. So that if white people feel guilty, they come to black people because there is an expectation rooted in history that black people will take care of their emotions in the way that they took care of their physical bodies historically. So that emotional justice, we say, you need to look to how the history taught you to expect black people to take care of your emotions, your guilt, your feelings of feeling bad, the way that your bodies were taken care of by black people. That's why it's a dismantling. The dismantling of the expectation that we take care of your emotions. That's the first part. But the second part is that, and we, when we do emotional justice training, and we were doing this training in Chicago actually, uh, I was working with a group of white, they're working in a seminary and there were white progressive men who wanted to work with me and they worked with communities of color. And I said to them, okay, so why are you working in communities of color? And they said, what do you mean? I said, you said you do, um, you do work around injustice, you do work around change, you do work around bringing communities to account. Um, why are you working in communities of color? And they said, there was just this long pause. I said, here's the thing you, your work is among white people. Your work as white, somebody who claims a belief in justice, in progress, in equality, your work is, is around white people. The reason you are around black people is that your historical context is the expectation that you will be celebrated and elevated as a result of moving within the black community. And you've also been taught that it is of course our problem and that your work is to help show us how much of a problem we have so that we can unhave it. And 
that that learning is manifest merely by your presence in uh, any black space where you're doing any kind of justice work. And the reason you don't go to white communities is there's no celebration, no one's gonna applaud you. You're gonna have absolute major pushback. And that's not what you're, you're coming to this work to do. I said, so I challenge whether or not you actually believe in justice. If you are not working within white communities to dismantle the systems that make the work of millions of black people so challenging, then I do not accept that you believe in justice. Because if you believe in justice, go home. Go home to your um, organizations, your centers, your communities, and say, what is the work that we have to do to dismantle that kind of emotional patriarchy, to dismantle those systems? What is that work? How do I do it and contribute to it? How do I connect my individual behavior to the institutions that I am part of? Because two things have to happen. Um, Black people have learned that our learned behavior as a result of the histories of brutality and white supremacy has been to manage our emotions because we know that white people could literally kill you on a whim. That is the historical context for which emotions happen. But that history manifests today in these so-called progressive relationships where you may claim a progressive politics, but your emotionality is still in the plantations, it's still in empire, it's still in colonization, it's still in apartheid, it's still in those places. Because if it wasn't, you wouldn't even be with black people because you would have understood already that the issue is with you and with your own. So for white people who say you believe in justice, what does it mean to turn around and go home? and say, okay, this is what I commit to. And what we say in emotional justice is what is the action that you commit to dismantle in order to have a place at the table of equity? And if you are not committed to an action within your own community of whiteness, whether it's an organization, within your community that is home, within your work, within your business, if you're not doing a specific action, you cannot have a seat at a table of any kind of justice. And that is the required work so that I'm not interested. You're all of all, all organizations at this point have what I call a policy. They'll say we have zero tolerance of racism. We are fully committed to diversity and emotional justice. We say, I want to look at the culture. We measure the culture of your organization by the lived experience of the diverse people, the differently abled people, the LGBTQ community people that are working within your organization. They are the measure of whether this culture is progressive or not. And the way you measure success has to change, has to be measured according to how are black people doing. In that space of white, um, what white people do, I say to them, we've heard of the glass ceiling, which is to do with um, gender issues. In emotional justice, we talk about the black ceiling. The black ceiling are the spaces where beyond those spaces, you never see any people of color. They're just not there. Those are the decision-making rooms where things can actually change, where money changes hands, where policy changes, where incremental organizational change can happen. What is the black ceiling in your organization and what are you actively doing to dismantle it? So in this moment that is transformative for white progressives, the emotional justice charges, your work is specifically accountability, personal and organizational. It is looking at the culture of your community, whether that's in your work, in your business, in your home, and it's committing to a specific action. And the action that you have, you don't need to call your black friend and inform them that you're doing that any kind of action. We will know you're doing the action because we should experience the change that you claim you're working to create. And uh, so, sorry, I think one of the biggest challenges with action from white, most white people is white fragility, right? They can't move past their own emotions of guilt and shame and, and, and this idea that, you know, black, I, I love the language you use, black mammy, you know, historically we, particularly black women have been given the role to take care of white people. So talk a little bit about white fragility um, as it relates to your work in emotional justice. So with, so with emotional justice, we have a very specific phrase and sentence around white fragility. And we say with empathy, it is your issue to deal with and it is your trauma to heal from. 
say that again. I need you to say it again because we, you yeah. know, in the black church, it, it only means something. It has authority when you repeat it. Come on and say that again. <laughs> in emotional justice, we have a very specific phrase around those progressives who claim allyship, who claim wanting to do this work, talking about white fragility. We say with empathy and love, this is your issue to deal with and it is your trauma to heal from. Do not bring it to black people. It's got nothing to do with us. Do not expect them to handle it. It has nothing to do with us. And it is a complete sentence that has no additional caveats, no explanation, no clarification, no justification. That is our stance when it comes to this thing called white fragility. Because in emotional justice, we say, there is no way you could come from a people that enslaved an entire people, brutalized them, killed them, and built a superpower, and then talked about white fragility. We reject that as an entire concept and say, no, it is not that you're fragile, it is that you're unwilling. That is different. But that unwillingness is your issue to deal with, and it is your trauma to heal from. You don't get to become a superpower on the backs of Black people and tell us that you can't handle your emotions. We have to reject that at source and do so with specificity. And so, of course, there's the New York Times bestselling book, Dr. Robin D'Angelo, which breaks all of that down. And what I say, with all respect to uh, the good doctor, for Black people, it's a sentence. Your issue to deal with, your trauma to heal from, don't bring that to Black people. It has nothing to do with us. My Next God. question. My God. So then we need to talk about white women weaponizing their tears, right? And so the Amy, Amy Coopers of the world that we have to deal with, right? This idea that white women are fragile and they're always ready to cry whenever they're confronted with anything. You know, I wrote a post a couple of weeks ago about my experience with Amy Coopers in my world, particularly in the workplace, right? The many times that I've had a conversation or even confronted a white colleague and they got so emotional and, and even suggested that I was so problematic in how I approached them that some even had to go home. They couldn't really, they couldn't stay and 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 and, and, and you know and and, and um, finish out the day because they were so traumatized by this conversation I had with them. So yeah. talk a little bit because Amy Coopers of the world are everywhere. It's not just in the park in Central Park. It's in corporate America. It's in nonprofit work. It's in social justice work, it's in racial justice work. They sit on the boards, right? And so talk a little bit about the Amy Coopers of the world and how problem, because Amy Cooper is supposed to be a liberal, right? She's a yeah. Democrat, right? Yeah. She's donated to Obama, to the Obama campaign, right? And so here's a woman, a white woman who lives in New York City, right? Who really feels like she's evolved and she's liberal and she's for the cause. And the moment she gets confronted by a black person who want to hold her accountable, she used her tears as a weapon, right? To aim to kill him. So we need to talk about the Amy Coopers of the world. Right. And I mean, in with emotional justice and for white women, Amy Cooper is particularly and specifically instructive. Because what Amy Cooper reminds us of, and it's something that we say in emotional justice all the time, is that emotional justice pays no attention to your politics. It pays no attention to whether you're progressive or not progressive. Because Amy Cooper reminds us that it doesn't matter what your politics is. You will weaponize not your tears. She weaponized white supremacy. You mm -hmm. weaponize the system of brutality that you know killed and killed black people in a moment when you wanted to ex, um, exhale power. You knew what you were doing. You did it knowingly and clearly. So you can never again say that you didn't know that you're so fragile. None of those weapons stand and that moment is instructive for that. So when it comes to white women, Amy Cooper becomes the benchmark for the lie around we don't know, we didn't understand, we don't have the context. Because Amy Cooper stands in, a, a, in Central Park in 2020, but she is sitting on 500 years of history of enslavement in America, of apartheid in South Africa, of colonialism across Africa, and weaponizing all of that history in a moment that could very well have taken a black man's life. 
And so I wrote a, 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 a piece. I have an emotional justice writing series in a um, portal called Warscapes. And I wrote a piece called Armed, White and Deadly, Unarmed, Black and Dead. And I talk about Amy Cooper, I'll post it in the, in the chat section. I talk about Amy Cooper saying that she becomes the benchmark for all white women progressives to measure themselves by. She becomes the benchmark because she knew how to weaponize a history in order to practice the kind of inequality that put a black person's life in danger. So what we say in emotional justice is if you know how to weaponize the history strategically to take action to endanger a man's life, you know strategically how to dismantle a system in order to create the kind of equ equity that you politically believe in, even though your behavior tells a different story. So that in emotional justice, we say that you may have Amy Cooper's politics, but do you also have her behavior when confronted by what accountability may feel or look like in a moment? And that is your yardstick to measure your own ability. Because when we talk about the emotional mammies, the expectation that black people take care of you is what white people have to confront. That's why we say that emotional justice, whether you're white progressive, white Republican, I'm not interested in your politics. Because again, you may have nurtured your politics. It doesn't stop you weaponizing white supremacy in a moment. Your progressive politics, your white supremacy, emotionality sits in the same body. The reason we're able to have this conversation is thank God for Christine Cooper's sister who posted the, the video. And thank God the police, because if Christian Cooper, God forbid anything had happened to him, this is not a story that we could tell. But in this moment, the universe, the ancestors are giving us tools to do our work. And so in emotional justice, we say, Amy Cooper is instructive. Either you are her or you're somebody who believes in justice. If you're somebody who believes in justice, what would you have done as a white woman in that park seeing Amy Cooper do what she did? As a bystander who has been complicit, who walks in complicity, what would you have done in that space? And what will you do the next time? How will you take action so that you are not her? And it's not enough to call her out. You have to connect your individual behavior to what organizational reform looks like. Yeah, this is so powerful. And the, the, the chat, the comment section is on fire. Oftentimes we talk about white women tears and the Amy Coopers, and we don't talk enough about white men rage, right? right. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about white men rage here. Um, oh, I can't think of his name right now, but a couple of years ago, the white man who walked in the police, uh, the the black church on a Thursday evening. Dylan Roof. Dylan Roof. Dylan Roof. Let's talk about the Dylan Wolf because we Dylan Wolf is not an isolated incident, all right? Absolutely. Dylan Wolf is the norm, and Absolutely. particularly in the black history, white men rage and how dangerous. I don't think we talk enough about white men rage, so let's talk about that. And I, so this is really important in emotional justice. As I said, that emotional justice for white people is a reckoning. Specifically when it comes to white men, the thing that we do in society is that we individualize, we humanize, and we rationalize the most heinous of yes. white men's behavior yes. in order to not collectively describe white men as mass murderers who just take people out. And I would say specifically with Dylan Roof, it's not white man to me, for, in emotional justice, we say it's not white man's rage. It is white men's inadequacy. Mm. It is white men wanting to practice the power of white supremacy and finding nobody, not, not nobody, but nobody, no individual body against whom they can practice that. So what do they do? They lean on a 500 year history and practice their powerlessness their fragility. And that comes again, um, when we talk about emotional patriarchy, the, the system where we bow down to the, um, the um, feelings of white men. So I feel inadequate. The way that I feel more powerful is if you are on the ground dead and bleeding, not one, not two, not three, not four, nine, nine African-American people praying in a church were killed so that one white 20 something year old can feel more powerful. Right. This is why we say in emotional justice is, is that in, our, in this history of enslavement, of 
uh, apartheid, of colonialism, and this global Black history, the cancer of white supremacy is that it requires subjugation to feel power. It cannot experience power outside of that. And so because that's the reality, and then because white becomes the default, whether it's the media and that's mainstream progressives or respective, the willingness to do what I call try and reason with whiteness. Who, who, what sane person reasons with a white mass murderer? And yet that's what people do. That's what the police did when they came to pick him up, put him in, put a mass murderer taken peacefully, not a scratch on his body. Humanity stopped to get him food on the way to, uh, the, to the precinct. You can see a mass murderer and see in him a humanity. Why? Because the default measure of humanity is white men. And when that is the, um, the default position of humanity, it becomes how um, people then engage. So they do this all the time. The, the profile of mass murderers in America over the last 10 to 15 years, there was an article in Mother Jones the profile has been, they've been connected with the military in some way. They're often in their um, mid twenties. They often claim some kind of Christian background. If you on that basis said, we should be out here profiling white men in their twenties who've been in the military because history shows that they are the people that go out there and kill on a mass level, the outcry in this country, because racial profiling has never been about the people that actually commit the heinous crimes because that's not how our emotional economy is constructed. Emotional economy matters. It matters because the, the emotional patriarchy makes white men's feelings matter above everybody else's, no matter the cost and the consequence. The cost and the consequence is Trump. The cost and the consequence is Dylan Roof. The cost and the consequence is Brett Kavanaugh. The cost and the consequence is every, um, white man in a suit who believes that his way of practicing equality is I know better than you black person so I can tell you how this thing should work and they think because they're not Dylan Roof that means that they're somewhere over there no both of those philosophies manifest out of the untreated trauma of white supremacy it is cancer to believe that your whiteness makes you better than somebody black, just as it is equally dangerous for black inferiority to exist in that space. And in emotional justice, we call them twin illusions, that actually white supremacist makes you delusional, because of course you're not more supreme. That's just simply not the truth. But your learned experience, your learned lived experience has meant that white privilege expects you to always succeed. Dylan Roof kills nine people because why? You're not successful with women and you can't get what it is you say that you want. Imagine if, as Kimberly Jones said, black people were not seeking equality, but they were seeking revenge. We would have worlds that are bloodbaths. Thank God that that is not what we are doing. That is why emotional justice matters. That's why a global black people enslaved, built entire superpowers, built nations, whether that's in America, that's Kenya, that's um, South Africa, you built entire nations. Imagine what a healed black people could build. You know, Imagine what we would create. This is in the comments, and I know Anna's going to come back and facilitate the, the Q&A from the audience. So I want to remind those who are watching, please write your comments or even questions so that we might engage you in a few minutes. But in the comments here, before we move on, I, I want to speak, I, want, I, want, I would like for you to speak a little bit about the ways in which Black men respond to white women. And so the comment here says, I've seen Black men who were literally in the middle of protesting, consoling a white woman he didn't know who became emotional like he went into autopilot and this is a, a norm this is not an exception right this this th this unique way black men tend to respond to white women that often black women don't get that from them right and so speak a little bit about because we talked about the historical mammy right black women mammy but there's something to be said about black men and the way in which they respond to white women too that's problematic 
And so, and so in emotional justice, we always start with how do black people respond to themselves first? We always center ourselves in every conversation. So we start with how do you respond to yourself? How do you respond to your own needs, your own pain, your own hurt? How do you respond to the hurt and pain of somebody else who's black of the same um, gender as you? And then how do you respond to the, uh, somebody of a different gender than you? And part of what the untreated trauma that is the result of our global histories has done, it has dehumanized us to each other. And specifically, it has dehumanized black women in the spirit, in the heart of black men. And what I mean by that is there are historically the brutality of the systems of injustice that have built entire nations where they took a toll and where that untreated trauma shape shifted who we became was to each other. So our instinct, our instinct is not to reach to one another in loving, tender ways. Part of the, um, the emotional injustice that comes from systems of brutality is that we don't look at each other with a tenderness. Black women don't look into the eyes of black women too often with a tenderness and a care if somebody's having a moment or a meltdown. Get it together, sis. Right. Get it together, pull, it, pull yourself together. Don't let them see you weak, sis. That's how we speak with each other. And black men have the language of two things. There is, a, there is a reluctant dependence on black women to kind of rescue or um, resist on behalf of black men's bodies who've been um, attacked by the state on the one hand. And then there's the mistrust of black women in the same space. And all of that sits in a space of untreated trauma due to our history. And so, it for me is never that a black man consoles a white woman. It is whether or not he was willing to console a black woman. Mm -hmm. And how we turn to each other with what can be a hardness and a hurtfulness and a harmfulness and then can turn to whiteness and all the histories of having to shape shift your spirit to make sure you can keep that overseer happy because that may mean your life. It could mean the selling of your body, the selling of somebody that you love's body. That history wells up and manifests in your spirit and how you deal with someone else. So as a, as a, a black woman who, like millions of black women, who stands and loves um, um, black men, it hurts so much more because you are who I love. That's right. You are who has been friend, brother, lover, father, all of those things. And so when that person turns away or does not reach out to support or to protect, it's particularly peculiarly hard. In the same vein, black women, the, the, the untreated trauma from those same systems of brutality and justice shape shifted how we loved. Because in order to survive the loss of so much, who did you spiritually have to become to stay standing? I remember in South Africa, women saying, you, when they put everybody, when the men were sent to jail, the women had to decide who we're gonna be for ourselves and for our children and for our community. Who were we gonna be? White men said, when we put those men in jail, the movement was dead because they, they, black women are so often underestimated. How we love each other is manifest in the untreated trauma of our history. And that's why emotional justice first and foremost is about a healing for global black people so that we can love each other more justly. There is nothing more powerful than the ways black people love each other. The revolutions, the fact that we've moved nations inches towards justice is a result of how black people love. And yeah. so turning that to each other, looking each other in the eyes and making a choice to love each other differently, to love each other from a place that is more just, that is more tender, but also acknowledges there is a mutual pain that is sometimes really hard to see. And this is hard to say, but in emotional justice, we talk about how the trauma of black women is kind of repulsive to black communities. 
that mm. black women breaking down is repulsive to black beauty. So keep that far away from me. I don't want to see none of that. I don't want to see none of that. So come back when you get it together, come back then. But that's not how you, we cannot heal that way. That's right. So how do we learn to hold each other differently, even in these moments of trauma? It's, it's repulsive, but I also think sometimes Black men feel they're being attacked, right? So historically, Black women often had to choose. We had to choose whether we want to be Black or whether we wanted to be a woman, because to be a full to be both black women or men, uh, to be a black woman meant we also had to speak truth to the ways in which um, black women's injustice uh, or experience with black women, I mean, sorry, black women's experience with black men have not always been just, just loving or justice worthy, right? And so black women historically often have to choose whether we wanna be a woman or whether we want to be black, we can't be both because to be both mean we're going to be what history says is we're going to betray one or the other. So oftentimes, that's why I think um, uh, schools of thought like womanism, right, social political uh, ideas like womanism is so important. Black feminism is so important because um, these are spaces where our lived experiences are are given authority. Right, but also language to reclaim both, all of our humanity to be both black and woman all at the same time unapologetically. And so uh, what I would, and so what's really powerful, you know, in emotional justice, we talk quite a lot about this specifically. And what we say is that to come to a place of healing around this issue is that black people can never say to black women to be either black or woman. Right. It is simply unloving and unhealing to ask that because the reality is you came, you came out of the womb black and woman. That is who you are. So anytime there is a requirement for you to choose one or the other, um, that means people are saying to you, don't choose yourself. Don't put yourself first. Either, you're, either it's black first or it's woman first. But if you are both and you're not being engaged to put both together, then the world, whether it's black men or whether it's um, white women are saying to you, don't choose yourself, don't privilege yourself. That is unloving and it is unjust. Mm -hmm. And part of our healing is to say, you as a black man come to the table fully. Right. I as a black woman have to come to the table fully. And then just to break it down and get all the way real, then we're gonna have to figure out some difficult shit. We just have to figure this out. But what we cannot do, no one can ever say to me, either you're black or you're a woman. Because I've always, my whole life, been both. I will never not be anything other than what I am. And I want to be, and I expect to be, and I desire to be loved in the totality of who I am. That's right. Black men desire the same thing. That's what people desire. And so, um, part of the challenge of, and part of the, a really important part of the work of emotional justice is black people loving each other more justly. That's and right. to love each other more justly means you have to see me in the totality of who I am. That's and right. that may be hard for you, but being hard doesn't have to be harmful. It doesn't have, to, we don't have to hurt each other because it's hard. That's right. And so the emotional justice with the framework is saying, how do we find grace with each other when it gets hard? How do we find language and behavior that is more forgiving when it gets hard? Because if we don't, we are doomed to keep repeating this cycle of, um, well, I don't like this because I feel attacked. And so let's get to what it is you're actually feeling and how do we move through that so we can get to another place. Um, the reality is black men have been attacked, black women have been attacked. Being attacked has been an intimate part of what I call black people having an intimate relationship with violence. They have been attacked physically, emotionally, sexually for 500 years across continents. Right. And so our healing has to be that learned behavior of attack is part of what we have to dismantle. And that attack may be with the words, it may be with your absence, it may be with the way that you withdraw, it may be your choice to literally not see me as I'm standing in front of you. That's right. uh, it, 
asking a black woman to choose being black or being a woman is a harmful thing to us. We don't want to harm, continue to harm each other. So emotional justice is the question is, how do we love each other more justly? That doesn't mean you can't wish away trauma and you cannot PhD your way out of trauma. So your education, whatever that is, won't necessarily serve you within a, within a space of emotional justice. It's the untreated trauma um, that has survived the movements that we built to gain civil rights, to gain social justice, to literally move from, from enslavement to abolition, to move from colonialism to independence, all of that movement work, we stand on the shoulders of all of it. It's not a negation of what has gone before. It's that every generation has their work. And what we argue in emotional justice is this moment, this time, must be about our emotionality because we've done so much other work. But in this moment, once it's about your humanity, it's about your heart and your soul. But your heart and your soul is no less political than because it's a part of your body. How do we engage there? So just in conclusion on that piece around black men and black women, we need to love each other more justly and we both need to unlearn how to, we, we need to unlearn some of the amazing ways we are harmful to each other. We are harmful in ways that are, we think that we, that we use humor, um, we use our bodies, we use our skin tone, we use all these ways that are harmful. And we have to learn to be equally creative of what it means to be loving and what it means to be more tender. But ultimately we have to ask, answer the question, how do I love my sister more justly? How do I love my brother more justly? How do I want my man to love me more justly? How do I want to love my man more justly? I'm looking at the time and right before we go into the audience conversation, I want to talk a little bit about the global effect, right? So the other day, Esther, you and I were talking and you mentioned how you had to talk to, or your grandmother, who's 83, was it? 83? My mother, who's 84. Your mom, who's 83, who's asking about George Floyd and why did George Floyd have to die? Woke up this morning to your uh, Ghana's president who says that he's, you know, he sends a message of condolences to George Floyd's family. And they also did a beautiful thing where they added George Floyd's name um, to, uh, to, 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 to the, um, to the um, trans um, Atlantic slave trade memorial. Um, and so this global effect that's happening right now, right? George Floyd's name is being lifted up all over the nation, not the country, the nation, right? People are protesting all over the nation. So talk a little bit about why is this particular time and this, because this is not the first time Right, Black people all over the nation is responding, but talk a little bit about what's happening right now and why this particular incident took a global effect and, and what is our ancestors, because you mentioned earlier that our ancestors are literally, literally giving us tools, right, to rise for the moment. Talk a little bit about what our ancestors, right, are giving us in this moment and where we go from here. Mm. So I have a, a deeply Christian mama who is 84 years old, turning 85 this year. And she came in and said, this man, George Floyd, what did they do to him? And I said, you know, Ma, there's a, you know, there's a video. And she looked at me and I said, I don't think you want to see the video. And she said, show me the video. So I said to her, I've seen it. I cannot watch it again. I will show it to you. And I showed it to her. And um, she got her circle a Christian circle of elders, all octogenarians, and they gathered in Accra, Ghana, in their homes, and did a Zoom prayer over the families of George Floyd. I want us to think about the elders of another continent who would never in any world have necessarily met Mr. Floyd, gathering together, together in their homes. All of these ladies are over 80 and saying George Floyd's name, putting his name in prayer for the ancestors. Um, in Ghana in particular, there is a long and beautiful, powerful history of African-Americans and Africans out of the Pan-African um, history coming together. We have a sizable African-American community here in, in Ghana. Of course, last year, 2019, was the year of return, um, 400 years since the first enslaved Africans were taken from Cape Coast. They call it a castle, I call it a dungeon, from Cape Coast and landed on the shores of Virginia. 
15,000 African-Americans came home last year. 10,000 black British people came home to Ghana last year. Mm -hmm. And so the president made, brought his name to the nation's attention. This moment combines three things, pandemic, police brutality, and protests in a simultaneous moment. So what does the pandemic do? It roots us all in our homes mm -hmm. and focused on the news in a way that we're not traditionally focused. Mm -hmm. Everybody's attention is on the same thing at a particular moment. And then you have Ahmad Aubrey, which is literally like watching a piece of black and white film from history happening, literally watching white men, excuse my language, nigger hunts. That's literally what you're watching. That's what it feels like. I feel like I'm in another era. And then you have the no knock warrant and Breonna Taylor killed in her own home, an EMT. She is literally the front line of a pandemic who also falls to the state sanctioned violence that's police brutality. And then you have um, Chauvin and Floyd. And the image that you see of a black man face down and these white men on his neck becomes this visual symbol of 500 years of history in a moment. And then it's videoed for the world to see. And it is the combination of those three things together that literally sets the world on fire. But what for me it was in those three cumulative things plus the pandemic that disproportionately impacts um, black and brown people, you saw this um, untreated trauma that is historical pour out of people's bodies and drive them onto the streets. Untreated trauma and rage and pain, the, the pain of the man's voice calling out for his dead mother and for his babies and witnessing all of those things. So in London, where I was born, there were protests. Um, in Berlin, in Amsterdam, in New Zealand, they did the haka for um, George Floyd. In Paris, you saw thousands of um, um, Francophone Africans gathering together in Australia, literally all over the world. And so the question for us as a black people, for me is then, what does this mean in the world of emotional justice for our healing? For white people, it has to be about two things, a reckoning, a dismantling that will lead to organizational reform. For black people, it must be about our healing because what is transformative for white progressives is traumatizing for global black people. The idea of years of history all clashing together in a moment to then see the protests and to witness police and riot shields, military style weaponry, snipers on roofs. You literally felt like you transported back into uh, the civil rights era and the marches that made, that enabled the civil rights act to happen. And you, but you're in a living history. You're literally in a contemporary moment of living history. The question is not just what do we do in this moment? The question is who do we become? And in emotional justice, we say, who do we become as black people? Because the work of witnessing is harmful work. And that harm manifests somehow and manifests in our bodies it may manifest again in how we treat each other. For the white people who are calling black friends and vowing to do better, know that those calls are harmful to the people that you think you're trying to help. And what emotional justice requires you to do is to interrogate your own emotions and really explore what it is you're coming with as opposed to knee-jerk reaction with the expectation of a response. So globally, there is this moment of reckoning even as people describe it as being revolutionary. That's right. When you marry a reckoning with a revolution, what do you create? What we have to be very clear is that white supremacy is an absolutely fierce beast that expects to manifest and shimmy its way through all this revolution to reemerge differently unless people stop it and choose to do the work of dismantling. That's a direct message to white progressive, progressives. For black people, what must our global black healing look like and feel like as we move into a normal that does not normalize brutality? And by that, I mean, we stop using certain expressions. We stop saying things like 
he was an unarmed black man. Because you know, you have mass murderers who are treated humanely. It is not about the weapons on his body. It's about his body and blackness being treated as a weapon. Right. What does it mean to end that? And so globally, there was this rise of historical pain and power. Globally, what might it create? That's right. That's right. This is a lot. I'm going to, I want to bring back Anna. This, I'm just, this is just, it's emotional. It's breathtaking. It's revitalizing for me as a Black woman who have really been traumatically impacted by um, by this on a personal level. And so thank you so much. Uh, I want to bring back Anna because there's several questions and comments from the audience. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, our, our comment section is just lighting up like crazy. It's absolutely on fire. And it, it's just been so powerful to hear what you have to share. And I'm, I'm just so grateful again that you're here. I want to start with a, um, a comment that came in from somebody in the audience, and it seemed to connect a little bit with a comment you made earlier. So the comment says, I've spoken to strong Black men, second guess their own feelings, second guess their own feelings of incidents of racial trauma inflicted upon them by white men, and rationalize the bad behavior away because of this sense of being powerless to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. And earlier you said emotional justice is not um, it's not reconciliation, it's accountability. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit more about accountability? What does that look like? Um, what are we talking about when we're talking about accountability? And I'm also particularly interested to know your perspective on a global scale, as well as, you know, when we're talking about, because I think you kind of referenced earlier, there's this, there's this desire to talk about George Floyd like this is an incident, but there's this longer, huge history of things going on. So can you just talk a little bit about accountability on a broader scale? Right, so thank you for the, um, to the commenter and for that comment. Um, and I think it's, it's an incredibly hurtful thing to witness um, black men do what I call shapeshift in their own bodies in order to rationalize the problematic behavior of white men. But we have to put that within the historical context of a learned behavior in order to survive. Because you have a history where black men may not survive an encounter with a white man unless he shifted his masculinity in a way that emasculated him in order to elevate that white man. That is the cancer of white supremacy within the specific focus of masculinity. That white men's sense of feeling powerful is only in relationship to the subjugation and exploitation of black men. And that, that manifestation is always problematic. It's problematic for both white men and black men. It's problematic because it means that there is no amount of subjugation that's gonna make white men feel powerful. So that means black people and black men will always die. For black men, when a system makes you less than who you are supposed to be, that is dangerous for your own heart and it's dangerous for the people around you who love you and who you love. Because how do you live and move and breathe and continue within that space? So what I say that when, you know, when I write about this um, in my work, that within black men, you have in their bodies, you have this space of sw swagger and this space of being scared because of the institutional reality of what racism does around masculinity. And both of those two things are really challenging. In America and Europe, that is specifically around issues of race in particular, it's in, within issues of black men and white men, black people, white people. When it comes to the continent, then it becomes an issue of gender. And the legacy of colonialism is African men who come from a history where a man being powerful and a woman being powerful was equally sexy. Power was swagger, but you had to hold it in your own body. You didn't derive power from somewhere else. And I want to be really clear. I don't believe in these kind of perfect spaces. Africa is not some perfect historical space that exists. I live here, I know different, but it's a beautiful space. And there was an extraordinary power historically. i am come from a tribe called the Ashanti. My tribe is matrilineal. Power within a woman was just standard. It was as common and garden as, as anything could be and power within a man was standard. The idea that a powerful man would be threatened by powerful women was not historically how we move. It was sexy as hell. The legacy of colonialism, 
because of white supremacy, white men's sense of power came from subjugation. Part of the legacy of colonialism in Africa is around gender. That for too many African men, power is about the subjugation of women. And it manifests in horrific levels of uh, gender-based violence, in sexually, sexual-based violence. Um, I see it here in Ghana. I've seen it in my work in South Africa. I've seen it in my work in Kenya. And so when, when we do emotional justice work in Africa, it's specifically around issues of gender and gender-based violence, because that's where the, the untreated trauma manifests. And what we say with emotional justice is that when you deal with emotional justice, you get to economic justice because a harmed people and a harmed nation cannot build economies, not emotional economies where well-being is at the center of it. And therefore you're able to build more because you flourish as opposed to building from places that are broken. So globally, we make differentiations according to the histories and the peoples of different um, nations, which is very important. And all, this is the, all of this is work coming out of the Arma Institute of Emotional Justice. I hope that answers the question. It does. Can I add here, um, before we move on, Anna, I think it's also important that we talk about systemic racism and institutional racism. And I appreciate the way in which you talked about the role of white people to dismantle racism, because here's the reality, right? Um, particularly black women, black men, black women in the workplace, it's really hard and tricky. It's even a risk to hold white people accountable when your livelihood is literally at stake. Right. When you think when I'm thinking what I'm thinking of are black men and women who um, are police officers who hear right the racist comments that their counterparts um, um, say right who do things and yet because they are under this kind of like blue um, secret space where they can't hold each other accountable in that way without the risk of being um, even the risk of not just their jobs, but the way in which they're treated in, 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 in the workspace, um, I think it's, it's important to talk about, right? And so mm. part of the comment that I, or the question that you mentioned, listed here, Anna, was here, here is while the, 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 the work of anti-racism is to hold people accountable, but there's a huge risk when I'm at work and you know my, my, my supervisor does not hold um, the same values around anti-racism. Now, how do I hold this person accountable when my job literally is at stake? So, I mean, that's such an important point and it's part of with emotional justice. We talk about um, organizational reform and organizational accountability because as Ava DuVernay says so powerfully, these systems were, are not broken. They were built to function, to serve however heinous the behavior of white managers, white supervisors, whether they're white overseers historically, they were built to do exactly that. Right. So the idea is not that you risk your livelihood, which is why this moment becomes trans transformative for those who define and describe themselves as white progressives, or white progressives and white allies. This is how they must connect their individual work to institutional and organizational reform. Black people should no longer have to risk their livelihoods in order to hold a supervisor accountable. So the question is to those white allies, to the white progressives, you are witnessing, because it's rare that it's a black person working alone. That's a rare space. The question to those white allies, how are you manifesting accountability in your organizations for those people around you who you know are at fault. It is very rare that people don't know who the people are who are tricky, faulty, problematic, acting crazy and heinous. People know who those people are and they're allowed to get away with it for multiple reasons. So for those who claim themselves to be progressives, those who are white, this is part of your dismantling. So to dismantle the power and the power it's specifically about not, um, not watching as black people risk livelihoods in order to bring those who have different levels of power to account. 
And that has traditionally been how we think about accountability, that somebody with less power than you risks their entire future to hold you to account. That is not what we do in emotional justice. The truth and accountability session is about organizational reform. That means those who have more power have to do more work to hold those who have power to account, not the other way around. Yes, Anna, next question. I'm trying to catch all of the questions that are coming into the comment section, forgive me. I, I'm really curious, I wanna, um, you know, I think it's since we're talking especially about, you know, what does it mean for white allies and white co-conspirators, white progressives who wanna be involved in this work. We did have a question that someone put in, do you want your white sisters to stand with you and by you or just step away? Okay, so I wanna, that's a really, really important question. Do you know why? It's the wrong question. That's right. That's right. That's right. The question is not about how I feel about whether or not you stand. The question is either you believe in justice and equality or you don't. Right. And if you say you believe in equality and justice, stand because it's the right thing to do. This framing of do you want your, your white sisters to stand beside you or to stand beside you or step aside, it is manipulative. It is problematic. It comes down to this is framed to either be incentivized to stand beside us or to be applauded for the fact that you stand. I will give you neither. In emotional justice, we say this, this framing, that is your issue to deal with. Either you believe in justice or you don't. Either you watched that video and saw something horrific and a history of horror going down and you stand up because you won't let that horror stand. But if you require my permission to stand, I reject your belief that you believe in any kind of justice. Because whether mm. I did or didn't stand, where are you in this transformative moment? And measure right. where you are according to what you say you believe. This so is you why to, so, so, so to white progressive people, do not ask that question again. Don't ask it. It is a manipulative, unacceptable question to ask. This is why I so asked, I wanna hug you, throw you, I don't know what I wanna do with you right now. <laughs> this truth is just coming so prophetically and it's so needed right now, but this is why I think it's so important to shift the narrative from white allyship to co-conspirator, right? Because I, I love and appreciate what you said. It doesn't matter what the black sister think. Do you think that was unjust? Do you think it's right to stand? And so it put the responsibility back on white people to decide for themselves what it means to be human. And mm. also, also, but also what I want them to do is to interrogate a history that teaches you that you can only stand if you're being applauded That's by right. somebody black. That's that right. if if that's the condition under which you stand, then you, you need to interrogate whether or not you believe in equality and justice. That is not mm. an interrogation you do with me as your black sister. That is a conversation you have with your white girlfriends around lunch or Chardonnay or whatever, but you don't call your black folks to have that conversation. And part of dismantling the emotional patriarchy for white people, for white women, is to understand the harm that you cause in um, what I call emoting according to your white privilege, as opposed to interrogating whether or not what you're saying comes from a place of justice or from a place of whiteness. Whiteness mm. does not consider who you're speaking to and the trauma of this moment for black people. Whiteness indulges, it doesn't explore. Emotional mm. justice explores first, interrogate second, and then considers whether or not this is something that I even need to say to a black woman. That's why we say in emotional justice that this is your issue to deal with and it is your trauma to heal from, but don't bring it to black women. Next mm. We have time for one more question. I'm paying attention to the time. One more okay. So one more question, we've had several people uh, towards the end of the common thread have kind of popped in and they, they wanna talk about raising black children. Uh, and so I just wanna put this last question out there. How do we raise black children to feel safe? My son asked, will they kill me too when I grow up? Whew, my heart broke, 
my heart breaks a million times. I think of, um, I mean, I literally can see my friend's children. I can look into the eyes of black boys and black girls. I see that little five-year-old black girl who looked up at a police officer and said to him, are you going to shoot me? A five-year-old child even asking that question is symptomatic of how traumatizing this moment is. And how do I raise my children to be safe? You raise your children to be proud of who they are, that there is a safety and in integrity. There is a safety in um, a blackness that is whole and that is healed. There is um, a safety in your love of them. What none of us can do is promise you a safety from state sanctioned violence, but the power and the beauty and the um, badassness of being um, black, of knowing the history that you stand in, that you stand on the shoulders of a people who endured the most horrific things that enable us to stand here. There is a security in coming from a history that carries so much power, even as it shoulders so much pain. And so reach for, for your security and your safety in your blackness and take refuge there and know that that is haven, that that is shelter and that that is power. Ooh, wow. Esther, I cannot say thank you enough. Oh, can we just announce the next? We will, we will. I cannot say thank you enough for this prophetic moment. This hour was just prophetic in many ways because it brought, for me at least, a level of healing that I didn't realize I needed. Um, but also just clarity in terms of what this work is and what it's calling for all of us to do. And what I'm hearing you say is in this moment, it's calling black people to heal and it's calling white people to dismantle racism. And, and it's two different works, but the same, right? Um, it's calling black people to heal and it's calling white people dis to, to, to dismantle racism. Uh, this work, is, this hour was not enough and there's so many people who joined us. And I want us to talk a little bit, Esther, about the collaboration that Scarrett Bennett and the Armand Institute has come to um, this collaboration that we're working with. Um, I believe emotional justice is definitely the kind of work that we need in this season um, and beyond. And so for the next two weeks, weekend or Tuesdays, um, we, beginning June 23rd, we are going to actually have an emotional justice um, Zoom call where people get to come. They have to register so that we can continue this conversation. So Esther, tell us a little bit more about what these two experiences will be and why people should register. Uh, so the Armour Institute of Emotional Justice and the Scarrett Bennett Center are coming together to do this specific work. Um, the future is emotional justice. So session one is Tuesday, um, 23rd of June at 2, 2 p.m. Central Time, CST. And we will be exploring and expanding this framework of emotional justice. I've been doing this work for several years on different continents. We're bringing it as an institute to the world in this transformative moment. As I say, that is about healing for global black people and is about dismantling white supremacist systems and what we call emotional patriarchy for white people. And so coming together to further explore and interrogate. So what does that mean? What does that look like? How does that work? What role might I play? What role might my organization have? Um, and so we're very excited to do this. We're gonna have two sessions. The first one is Tuesday, the 23rd of June at 2 p.m. You must register. And I know I think Anna's dropping the link in the comments so that you can register right there. And we're very excited to work with the Scarrett Bennett Center. We'll be doing an emotional justice summit in 2021 as we bring this work um, further out to the world. And the Institute has launched what we call the Emotional Justice Truth and Accountability Sessions, which is a three-day workshop for organizations to do this work that I have been speaking of on this call. What does it mean? What does healing look like within an organizational 
reform structure? What does dismantling look like within an organizational reform structure? What does it mean to change our culture? So join us Tuesday, 23rd of June, 2 p.m. CST, and we'd be very excited to continue the conversation. Sharizna and I think we make a hell of a team, sis. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And a share, share with folks how they can register um, for, for these two experiences. Yes, so we have a, a page right up on our website with both of the dates for each session. Um, you can register for each one right there. We have a bit.ly link, so it's bit.ly slash emotional justice. Um, I also have pinned it in the comment section of this thread for the live feed, so you can find it right there. Great, and we'll post it on all our emotional justice platforms as well, and my social media platforms on Twitter at Esther Arma, on our emotional justice page on Facebook and on Instagram. So there'll be lots of in, uh, information. This has been such a pleasure. It has. You can has find been. this information on our website and all of our social media as well. Again, we want to continue this work on June 23rd, Tuesday, June 23rd at 2 p.m. Central Time. You can join us on a Zoom. This will not be Facebook Live because we want to go deeper. And so um, you have to register for this event. Um, this event is free for all and anyone can register for this. Anyone who want to go deeper to better understand emotional justice, but also to better understand your role and your work in dismantling racism. So we welcome you to join us. The first session is June 23rd at 2 p.m. That's a Tuesday, 2 p.m. Central Time. This will not be Facebook Live. You have to register for this event. The next one is June 30th. Again, Tuesday, June 30th at 2 p.m. Again, we will go deeper with Esther as she um, help us to understand our role with doing this work, eradicating racism as it relates to emotional justice. Esther, I cannot say thank you enough for this amazing hour. You have literally brought healing to many of us and clarity to many of us in terms of what is the work, right, of eradicating racism. And for those who join us late, I hope you heard it clearly. This work and this hour for Black people is to heal. It's to heal. And the work of white people is to eradicate racism. That is the work for us as human beings to be. And I want us to, I want to give you a minute, Esther, to just help uh, to share closing, closing statements as we end this hour. Um, share with us, what, what's your closing statement as we, we leave this space? We are um, a global people who are interconnected by histories of brutality and trauma. Those histories built brick worlds and they destroyed human worlds. Emotional justice is our work to rebuild the human world. That means the work of soul and the work of heart, the trauma that was the result of building these superpower bricks and mortar, that, has, that work now needs to be done within our bodies and souls. Our histories are interconnected and they are intra-racial and they're interracial. There is no world in this contemporary moment that doesn't combine black people and white people because of our dual history. We are living in a transformative and traumatizing moment. What will each of us do with this moment? So that when the question is asked and it will be asked, what was your role and what did you do? That your answer is about systemic change and institutional challenge that connects your individual life and work to institutional change. And you're able to answer that question with clarity, with truth and with integrity. Um, we say the future is emotional justice because of the worlds that Black people have built, the wars we have fought, the undeclared wars, which as we say enslavement, apartheid and colonialism were all undeclared wars against white people for which there was no GI Bill of healing. Emotional justice is our bill of self-care rights. We have to take that work on that's what we're doing. That is our contribution to this moment. For you who are black and brown and listening to this, listening to us, know that healing is your inheritance. 
It's your inheritance because your ancestors built worlds. Whether you think you participated or not, healing is your inheritance. You have a right to love and be loved in the fullest way possible. And a just love enables you to thrive and become who you are supposed to be. And unjust love maintains the status quo that we have. So white people, how are you going to engage in the dismantling of a system that benefits you each and every day, whether you claim to believe in it or not? What is your work going? What is, what is your answer going to be to the question, what is it that I did? And so we have our work. We have our worlds. We are changing our work in order to change our world. The future truly is emotional justice. Thank you. Thank you again for watching and we hope to see you on June 23rd at 2 p.m. as we go deeper in the work of emotional justice. Thank you for watching. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye everybody.